Okay, friend, uh, we are going to the, another video to, from Pastor Lon Kelly from Villages 7th Adventist Church. And so I believe you're going to be blessed by the message. It's a prophetic message, and time events is going to talk about things on uh, that you'll see and other things which are happening and which are going to happen. So I welcome you without wasting time. At least you can get something, okay? May God bless you. And it is certainly something that ought to make us aware that nations wane, though proud and stately. This last week, there was the release of a second encyclical from this pope called Laudate Diem. Glory to God. What I want you to know is that Ellen White's quite clear that while some of us are paying attention to things of minor import, the devil is stealing a march on God's people. We are in a great controversy. And the devil's not sitting around on his laurels, but perhaps sometimes the church is. Before we delve into that letter just a little bit, I, which is superbly important, I want to take a moment and look at one other general who didn't want to fight. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Judges, chapter 4. Judges, chapter 4. Now, this is the second judge to come on the scene, perhaps the third. She is a woman, and she is a woman of God. She is a brave lady who will bring a measure of courage into a fearful man. This is the story of Deborah and Barak. Judges chapter 4 says, Then the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor, and the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harosheth Hagoim. Now, you need to know that sometimes God wakes up his people through different types of bondage and suffering. And sometimes I think the withdrawal of his blessing is designed to bring us to an attentiveness that this isn't exactly what he promised. He told Joshua in chapter 1, pay attention to what I've told you in principle and in precept. Don't go left. Don't go right. Nobody will be able to stand, you all, stand against you all the days of your life. And you'll prosper in everything you do. In the beginning of the book of Psalms, the same thing is said. If you don't walk, sit, and, and fellowship with the evil ones, then God will make you like a tree planted by the water, and you'll prosper in everything you do. Now, I have to believe that the same God who set the sun some 90-some million miles away from us that makes everything work, everything, that that same God has the power to bring into his church at the end of time the same kind of glorious, amazing fruitfulness that it needs to succeed as a David versus a Goliath in a Goliath world. Here we are, God's people, one more time, minus the blessing of the Lord, and it appears that it's only hardship that will open their eyes. Verse 3, the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, and he said, for he had, that is, Sisera, 900 iron chariots, and he oppressed the sons of Israel severely for 20 years. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at the time. She used to sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel. And by the way, this is the same area that Samuel would make his later in the day prophetic journeys in the hill country of Ephraim. And the sons of Israel came up to her for judgment. Now she sent and she summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kedesh Naphtali. And she said to him, Behold, the Lord God of Israel has commanded, Go and march to Mount Tabor and take with you 10,000 men from the sons of Naphtali and the sons of Zebulun. Now, before God summons someone on the outside, typically to summon someone to a great task, he's already in the habit of speaking to that individual themselves. God doesn't come along with signs and wonders to talk to you. He comes along with a still, small voice. And he tries to break into the quiet, reflective phase of your life, which is why if this thing is with you all the time and it's constantly have you tethered to a cycle of attentiveness of worthless things, you'll be missing out on the most important messaging of your life, especially the young, because God may have a high and great calling to be honored throughout all eternity, and this thing may keep you tethered to the things that are low and superficial and earthly. But before God speaks to somebody with signs and wonders, he usually communicates in a still, small voice. I think it would probably be safe to say that Barak had been talked to by God before he was talked to by God's servant. The Lord God has commanded you. 
Verse 7, I will draw out to you Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his many troops to the river Kishon, and I will give him into your hands. Now, obviously, this must have been a man of some courage and renown, a man in which great things and noble aspirations had been stirring, but there's something still elementally wrong with him. And that elemental wrongness is that he's lagging far behind the woman leader of Israel when she directs him what to do. Then Barak said to her, I will go if you'll go with me, but if you won't go with me, I won't go. Now, mind you, two are better than one, and it might be fair enough for us to realize that throughout the last six millennia, most of the time, women are not on the battlefield to wield a sword. And for many years, they weren't there for any purpose. And certainly in the age of this experience, it would be highly unlikely to have a woman on the battlefield. It's one thing to say, I will go, perhaps with a bit more assurance. It's another thing to say, if you won't go, I won't go. It's nice to have a partner in ministry, and certainly it's valuable to have a man or woman of God standing by your side. But he does get a rebuke administered by the woman preacher. She said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the honor shall not be yours on the journey that you are about to take. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. Then Deborah rose and went with Barak to Kedesh. Now, the rest of the story is interesting. There is a descendant of Moses that lives on the outskirts of one of these tribes, married to a woman named Jael. The battle goes as Deborah said it would go. Sisera flees from one of his iron chariots and finds his place of rescue and relief, he thinks, from the enemy in the home of one that will give him comfort and sustenance. But that lady is faithful to her spiritual heritage and understands that this is an enemy of God, and she takes his life by driving a tent peg through his temple. What I want you to see in the celebratory song is there is an element of rebuke and affirmation for the different tribes of Israel, chapter 5. In chapter 5, it says, partway through Deborah's song of deliverance, verse 12, Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, sing a song. Arise, Barak, and take away your captives, O son of Abinoam. The survivor. I want to assure you today that echoing sentiment of eternity is still reverberating down through time. There is a great call to us to not let the devil steal a march on us. Seventh-day Adventism has gone through a wilderness period of the last 40 or 50 years. It appears barely disconnected from the culture, enjoying great wealth and great opportunity, expanding their empires, as it were, their financial opportunities, their educational privileges. But God's cause appears to be receding. Schools and churches closed in the process of barely hanging on. And yet we see that God keeps a record of those who faithfully engage in the battles of the Lord. Well, this morning I want to assure you there's a battle that's heating up that you need to know about. And I'm going to reference to two things, one Catholic and one Protestant. And I'm going to show you that just in the last three days, we have clear, clarion call that God's people are to gird their armor on, stand firm everyone, and to rest our cause upon his holy name. This encyclical came out several years ago. This one came out on the 4th, so about four days ago. Official publication of the Holy See. The only slides I'm going to show you here come either from the Catholic News Agency or CNN. I didn't have to go looking far and wide. As a matter of fact, I'm thankful to Dr. Rice who provided them for me with a little bit of adaptation by myself. October 4th, this week, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, presiding Bishop Joseph Kurtz, called the encyclical Our Marching Orders for Advocacy. I don't want you to miss the military um, metaphor. The document launched the Laudate Si movement, which builds itself as a broad range of Catholic organizations and grassroots members from all over the world walking on a journey of e ecological conversion. 
Francis since 2015, that's the Pope, current Pope, has been active in warning about the potential devastation posed by climate change. In 2021, he launched the Catholic Church's seven-year Laudato Si action plan, which he described as the church's part in a new ecological approach that can transform our way of dwelling in the world. Now, whether this is by stratagem or accident, what I just need you to understand is that Laudato Si is an appeal based on science. It's based on evidence. What I'm going to show you today is that Laudato Deum is an appeal to the brokenness of humanity and the spiritual need for change. Major sea shift. The Pope pointed to what he described as the spiritual motivations of climate action, noting that the book of Genesis records that upon his creation of the universe, God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. This is Ludato Deum. This is not the old encyclical. This is the one from earlier this week. Praise God is the title of this letter. That's what Ludate Deum means. Francis wrote at the encyclical's conclusion. For when human beings claim to take God's place, they become their own worst enemies. No longer a spiritual discussion. This is a global social discussion. We can forget the science. Everybody's pretty convinced that the weather's out of whack. It's a social issue, and we're going to see spiritual, and one of the intimately related to the dignity of human life. And who wouldn't want to be on the front sides of the dignity of human life? The bishops of the United States have expressed very well the social meaning of our concern about climate change, which goes beyond a merely ecological approach. And I'm going to go to the second paragraph. And to express bluntly that this is no longer a secondary or ideological question, but a drama that harms us all. The African bishop stated that climate change makes manifest a striking example, tragic and striking example of structural sin. What I want you to see is that the Catholic Church is laying a call to repentance at the feet of every human being. This is a complete sea change. It should call us to take our stand. We are naked and exposed in the face of our ever-increasing power. That is our power to harm the earth. Lacking the wherewithal to control it. There's a spiritual social problem. We've had certain superficial mechanisms, but we cannot claim to have a sound ethic, a culture and spirituality genuinely capable of setting limits and teaching clear-minded self-restraint. Who could set ethical limits and teach clear-minded self-restraint? Well, it's only God, but the church will do in their mind as a stand-in. To suppose that all problems in the future will be able to be solved by technological interventions is a form of homicidal pragmatism. I mean, these are some laser-sharp words. Once and for all, let us put an end to the irresponsible derision that would present this issue as something purely ecological, green, romantic, frequently subject to ridicule by economic interests. What is he saying? He's saying all the pundits out there, especially the economists, can look at this and say it'll never work. They say, let's get over it. They have a good video to move your heart, which videos are good at doing. But he goes on to say, let us finally admit that it's a human social problem on any number of levels. Our world has become so multipolar and at the same time so complex that a different framework for effective cooperation is required. And what is that? It's a matter of establishing global and effective rules that can permit and provide for this global safeguarding. This document is all for turning over sovereign national rights to global multinationals for implementation and power to punish. It continued to be regrettable, the Pope would say, that global crises are being squandered. And of course, we're all familiar with the line that it'd be a terrible thing to waste a crisis. Well, that's what they're saying when there could be occasion to bring about beneficial changes. I cannot deny that it's necessary to be honest and recognize that the most effective solutions will not come from individual efforts alone, but above all from major political decisions on the national and the international level. And while I don't have time or the preparation to do this for you, Dr. Rice assured me that a part of this of this encyclical is an encouragement for a grassroots rising up that will force the politicians. And of course, the spirit of prophecy gives affirmation to this. Now, I'm not going to open the book of Nehemiah. I'm just going to show you five lessons about how to confront fear and its immobilizing dynamics. The first thing is Nehemiah is in the king's council feeling pretty depressed because he's gotten word that Jerusalem is in ruins. 
He gets that word. He's not supposed to look sad before the king. The king notices, but if, the, if Nehemiah wouldn't have been honest, this would have been a problem. Earlier this week, I was having a conversation about one of the ministries of the church with someone at an institutional level, and I told them it's failing. The person turned that around and tried to make a statement about how I really felt about the ministry, when it's probably the ministry I've given more of my heart, prayers, energies, efforts, and finances to support. If you can't be honest about what's going on, you're not in the position to have the courage of Nehemiah and to do anything about it. You can be more like George McClellan. You can have the appearance, you can have the veneer, but it's all a facade. Somebody's got to see the problem. It doesn't mean you're anti, it doesn't mean you're against. At the beginning of this church's posture in regards to the vaccine, there were predictions that we would turn out to be a rebel group just like, and they could name them. Unfortunately, there are in, in the economy and the structure of God's church, in the rank and file of God's people, there are those that are honest of heart, give honor where honor is due, and can call a spade a spade and say, there is a problem. Nehemiah saw there was a problem. Secondly, Nehemiah prayed. The king said, something's wrong with you. What is it? Of course, this troubled Nehemiah. Nehemiah whispers a prayer to God. It's one of the few places in the Bible that you see this explained. He prayed. God answered that prayer. The king says, what would you like for me to do? And of course, Nehemiah has a plan. I need time off. I need wood from the, from the forest of Lebanon. I need letters. And the king did probably more than Nehemiah imagined because he got sent with money and permission to exact taxes and, and lived pretty good as a as a governor there in Israel, but Nehemiah didn't take up his offer to have a good life. Nehemiah was a sacrificial leader. Then somebody has to make a plan. The plan began. It was enacted. When he gets to Jerusalem, he takes two or three people with him, a small group. We don't know the exact number. And in the middle of the night, he goes around and he checks the place out. He's got encouragement from God's intervention. He's a praying man. It's what he thought was true was true. The place is a mess. Everybody's discouraged. And the next day, when he gathers all the leaders of Israel, he says, look, this is what God's done for me. I think this is what God wants us to do. What do you think? And they said, let's rise up and build. This can happen. When it's all said and done, he is the leader. And what a price he pays. He is, he is physically intimidated and would have been physically assaulted, and perhaps was. We don't know that for a fact, but he has... Jewish nobles that come to him, and the Bible says 10 times they tell him, they're going to get you, they're going to get you. He's intimidated, or at least attemptedly intimidated by the, the surrounding Samaritans, which are a, a, a ragtag group of semi-Israelites mixed with other pagan religions. They have to work with a, a sword in one hand. He has to have a trumpeter nearby. He has to have quite a network for defending himself. Later on, they try to scare him into hiding out. He won't do it. If you've got a battle on your hands, if there's an enemy you have to face, it's important that like Nehemiah, when everybody got discouraged and everybody was afraid, he can stand up and say, remember what God did. Don't be afraid. And the people weren't afraid. Now, I've showed you on the Catholic side, I've reminded you of the biblical model, nothing's going to change. As we look to the future, we need to know. We're going to have to be honest. You're going to have to be honest in your own heart. Your wife may have said something to you. Your parents, your children may have noticed. Your boss or your best friend. What I found as a pastor, it's very hard to convince somebody, especially if there's an idol in their lives. It appears that somehow they've got to go through a little harder chapter of awareness, and it's got to be a God thing. And of course, God does it all. He just gives us a part. But somebody's going to have to say and see. Somebody's going to have to go to God. Somebody's going to ask God to intervene and carry a story of faith into the midst of God's people so they encourage. Then there's going to have to be some leadership with a plan, and somebody's going to have to enact it. And it gets kind of rough when you enact it. That's what we know. Now, I had somebody send me this uh, yesterday. And the reason I'm bringing this right now is that as the Catholic Church pivots away from ecology and science to dealing with the ecological problem and starts pivoting to social, spiritual dynamics, I want you to understand that inside the Protestant world of our day, there's a pivot going on as well. There are those that, that some made mistakes in how they related to the dynamics of, of over-direction. 
during the COVID experience. But this documentary is number one on the Apple iTunes store, The Essential Church. It's almost two hours long. I almost never buy a video. But I downloaded it and began watching it yesterday. And the story coming from these three Protestant preachers, two of them from Canada, one from America, is that the church and the nation exist as co-equal, God-ordained societies. And that the nation is not over the church, but the church is there to be light and salt to the nation. And when those things get out of order, you have problems. And as I began watching this thing, it became clear to me, along with this awareness that it has put itself at the top in a major forum of social media outlets, that inside America there's a hunger for something authentic. There's a belief that something's wrong, and there's a hope that something can be made right. It's something I'm in the midst of watching. Now, when we come to the end, uh, when, when we get to, well, I shouldn't say this. Yeah, we're getting towards the end of some of the problematic moments under the reign of Eli. And you know, Eli's sons, they're very terrible men. The church is in terrible shape because of terrible leadership. Everybody's discouraged, but they say to themselves, I know what our mistake is. We didn't have the Ark of the Covenant with us, which was assumed to be the presence of God. They brought that Ark into the camp of the Israelites, and the shout was so loud that it shook the earth. And this is a quote from the Philistines. I don't want to give you the wrong idea. The Bible says the sons of darkness are more shrewd than the sons of light. And this is what the Philistines say. Be strong and quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews as they've been unto you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. It's kind of too bad to put such a beautiful backdrop against a statement like that, except that nobleness is nobleness, whether it comes through a Philistine or a Jew. In this case, I like what Paul did when in 1 Corinthians 6.13, he turned it all around. He said, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, and he grabs the phrase and he repurposes it for the purposes of God. Quit you like men, be strong. What I want you to know today is that God has offered his personal presence to be the assurance, strength, and provision of his church. He's got the promises out there for the final exodus that were there for the final steps of the conquest by Joshua. Don't turn to the left. Don't turn to the right. Nobody will be able to stand against you all the days of your life, and you'll prosper in everything you do. Now, we ought to be pleading for the prospering, and we ought to be listening for the call to repentance. We ought to be cleansing our hearts and our homes of the things that would rob us of the presence and the power of God. Your adversary, Peter would write, like the devil prowls around you like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But we always stop right there. But the next verse says, resist him. Stand steadfast in the faith. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This morning, I'm in the third, finishing the third of a series of sermons. I do believe there's an emotional regression in our land. I do believe we have bowed down at the altar of security and safety. I do believe that we've allowed lawyers and risk management experts and gurus. I do believe that auditors... I do believe that all these wise, good plans about planning for your future stand in the way of God's people taking some risk and moving forward in a little bit of faith. I didn't say presumption. I didn't say carelessness. But I'm here to tell you, like a mighty army is the church of God. And brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod, and we are not to be united, all one body, we one in faith and doctrine, one in charity. We've got a hymnal full of illusions and metaphors to the church as a mighty military movement. We need some structure. We need some order. We need lots of respect and trust. We need good communication. We need logistical efforts. We need all the leaders and managers we can put on the deck. Because I'm here to tell you this morning, the Catholic Church is pivoting to a new argument, and the Protestant world is saying it's time to stand up. The day's coming, and we're not to go into it afraid. It's time to quit wringing your hands. You want to have a 
different kind of experience, start selling some of the things you have. Start investing your time and your money in different ways. Start putting a personal private walk with God high up on the priority list so that you know the promises are mine. Every line. And may God help us all to say, we will not be derelict of duty like Reuben was and Asher and Dan in the day of the reluctant biblical general who would only go if the woman prophetess went with him. But I'm here to tell you today, if that's what we still need, let all the righteous women rise up. Could I get an amen? amen? I'm here to tell you. I'd like to see a little more backbone in any living human breathing being to say, you know what? God's name has been dishonored by this society, by its laws, by its culture. And let the mothers in Israel rise up and say, if you're too afraid to go, I'll go with you. But it is time for something to happen. Okay, uh, friend, I believe you have been blessed by this message uh, from this pastor. Though he has not explained a lot about Laudato Deum, Laudato Si, but actually we know and he has introduced it, and I don't think it's something new to you, but uh, what he has emphasized more was about being like man, being strong, going for, not giving up. If you're a religious leader, you are a pastor, there's no time for you to, uh, to work timidly. You just need to stand up and go as a man. That's a, uh, a word that has been used, to work as a man. Strong, faith, fearlessly. That is very important. So I don't think I have a lot of things to add on this video because it has been a self-explanatory, very simple, no any complexity. But we need to know Jesus for ourselves and to walk with the faith. Sometimes things may seem to be intimidating, but... We need to move forward. We need to look on Jesus Christ. We need to study our Bible and stand firmly. Because if we don't stand firmly, what will happen? Our enemies are going to use the same technique to overcome us. And so we need to take uh, advantage of having faith and fearlessly. Anything that you combat with the faith, uh, with God, you're going to win. That's why the Bible says, I can do all th things through Christ who strengthened me. So Jesus is there to give us strength so that we can move forward. And if so, we need to be strong by trusting on the power which is brought to us through faith by Jesus Christ. And that we can overcome what is going to face the world. That what is going to happen, nobody knows how is it to be. But we think and we can imagine that the situation is going to be worse. But what can we do is prepare ourselves and to aim higher at the pastor has spoken. So I believe you're going to be blessed by many, many sermons. Don't forget to visit Pastor Owen Kelly Kelly's sermons and Regis Church, even other sermons from other churches. May God bless you. Amen.